Welcome to Creating the Ideal Organization, a podcast from the Organizational Dynamics Community at the University of Pennsylvania, produced to inspire purposeful leadership practice and transform organizational experience. I'm your host, Steve Hart. Today I'm speaking with Sean Kent Hayashi, author, speaker, and distinguished alumni of the Organizational Dynamics Program. Sean is the founder and CEO of the Professional Development Group, LLC, and a global expert in developing inspiring leaders and high-performing teams. Growth, innovation, and elevated performance and profits are the results of Sean's work as an executive coach, speaker, and high-performing team consultant. Sean has been featured in the New York Times, Forbes, and Fast Company, and she's the author of six business communications books. Her most recent book is How to Improve Your Emotional Intelligence at Work and in Relationships. Welcome, Sean. I'm so thrilled to be here with you today, Steve. Now, Sean, in your book, uh, you state that you personally had a lightning bolt moment when you first heard the term emotionally illiterate. What was it about that term that was so profound for you? Oh, yes, that was quite a lightning bolt moment for me. Let me explain what was going on. At that time, I was responsible for leadership development in a large corporation. The president of our organization knew that some significant changes were coming. In fact, we were going to be merging, and he wanted me to help prepare our leadership team for significant change. He asked me to hire a PhD in change management and bring that guru in to work with our leadership team to dunk them in the Kool-Aid, if you will, and get them ready for this big change. After having the opportunity to meet one-on-one with each of the leaders, the change guru that I selected was meeting with me in my office. Imagine this scene. We're seated around my little conference table, and he says to me, you know, Sean, we have an issue here. We're not really able to address change yet because we have a far bigger thing we need to deal with. I say, what's that? He says, this is a group of emotionally illiterate leaders to which the lightning bolt goes off in me because I'm responsible for leadership development. How is it that I had not noticed that this was a group of emotionally illiterate leaders? Now, this also clicked on some other level in me. Emotional literacy. I kept playing with the idea. Literacy, what does it mean to be literate? Well, it means being able to read, right? And emotions, being able to read emotions. And this took me down a path that was really fascinating, exploring and learning about emotional intelligence. Yeah, great beginning. So you identify seven core emotions that make up the human realm of emotional intelligence or literacy. What are these emotions and why do you think it's important for leaders to learn and recognize? Ah, yes, indeed. So about that time that I discovered this notion of emotional literacy, I decided that I was going to solve the problem by creating an emotions dictionary that we could all use. I began to track every word that had an emotions connotation to it. You can imagine that, right? Yeah. There's loads of words. I got up to something like a thousand words in my emotions dictionary. And if at that time you had stopped me in the hallway and said, hi, Sean, how are you? What are you feeling today? This overwhelming sense of which of the thousand words is it that is the right one to use in this moment? Ah! <laughs> well, at that time- Overwhelming. Exactly, exactly. Well, I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Izzy Justice. And he has a PhD in emotional intelligence from the University of Pennsylvania, and he became a mentor of mine. And he and I were seated in a conversation, and I was trying to figure out how to identify, how to tease out which of those thousand is the right one. And he chuckled at me and said, ah, but Sean, there are actually seven core emotions. And every one of those thousand plus words that you've identified maps back to one of these seven core emotions. So here they are, love, joy, hope, envy, 
sadness, anger, and fear. The way that I've just given them to you is actually in a hierarchy that represents a vibrational scale. Now, Dr. Izzy Justice did not teach me that. Someone else taught me about the emotional vibrational scale. But when I began to understand that these are marinades, these are chemical marinades, if you will, and we can get triggered into one of these states, and we might use 50 different words to describe that state. We might have different words that we use to describe the same chemical marinade in ourselves. So you write that once people can learn and uh, recognize and account for their emotions, the goal of a leader is to guide their actions in healthy ways. Can you give me an example of what you mean by a healthy way? Yes. So imagine for a moment that I'm realizing that I have been triggered into love, joy, hope, excitement. I'm happy. What can I do with that? Well, do the things that will trigger more of that. Because when we really think about it as inspiring leaders, what we want to do is to be a vehicle for, a trigger for, a source for creating good things in the world. So keep doing more of that. But inevitably, we're human beings. We are going to experience envy, sadness, anger, and fear. And so it's knowing what to do with each of those emotions. Anger, for example, is a signal that something has crossed our boundaries. And if we will acknowledge in ourselves, to ourselves, what it is that has crossed our boundaries and think that through, who do I need to talk to about that boundary? Who do I need to make a request of? Maybe I need to make a request of myself or maybe I need to make a request of a colleague, a partner, a spouse about something that's important to me. But if I ignore that and I keep shoving that down, then I do what I call coming out sideways. Can you imagine somebody that you know who just seems perpetually angry? Oh yes, I'm sure we all can. <laughs> or, or somebody who's just sad, right? These are people who haven't dealt with their emotions, and as a result, there's just layers and layers of undealt with, stacked on, packed in emotions that are coming out sideways. And so to be healthy, we need a way to acknowledge what we're feeling in the moment. We need a way to process ourselves through that emotional experience and then move forward. So I know that you've done a lot of individual and group level coaching around these things. So. Let's explore a little bit more of the practical applications of this. What are some things that leaders who are interested in developing their emotional intelligence in the workplace can specifically do to grow in the areas that you've described? Oh, I love that question. So one is to create a learning journal. You could call it your emotional intelligence journal and begin to ask yourself randomly throughout the day of the seven emotions, which one am I feeling right now. So it's raising our self-awareness. When I do this with a coaching client, I'll have them create this journal. It might be a little book that they carry with them, or it could be a file in their computer. Well, and your book also has some worksheets in it, right? It sure does. My How to Improve Your Emotional Intelligence at Work and in Relationships is a guide that will do exactly what I'm talking about. But yes, so track randomly, three or more times per day, what are you feeling so that you can get in touch with your inner voice and become self-aware. Now, once you get masterful at that, you'll be able to spot, after doing this for about 30 days, you'll be able to spot what your predominant emotion patterns are. So as we mentioned before, some people have a tendency to be hanging out in sadness a lot, but they may not know it. Or one of the executives that I worked with recently was habitually in anger and he wasn't aware of it. And when he tracked this, he began to realize how often he was in that marinade. And then of course I teach people the questions to ask themselves in order to process themselves through an experience so that they can release it and, and move on to what's next. And that's what I mean when I say healthy. Process. Right. No, I get that. I think that's a great, great thing. And I, I think about the, the journey that somebody must be on. And I wonder, as you think about that, what challenges they might face as they work pur purposefully 
on this to develop their emotional intelligence? What are the likely things that uh, somebody engaged in this journey might encounter as they go along? So one is not being able to identify a particular emotion. For me, I... Certain blindness, right? Yes, yes. For me, I couldn't identify uh, the emotion of envy or jealousy. I, it just wasn't showing up in me. And like someone might look for a mile marker as they're on a highway driving somewhere, I'm looking for mile marker 88. I was like that with envy. I want to find the envy experience. Recognize. That's right. And then, uh, again, in my uh, relationship with Dr. Izzy jo Justice, as he was coaching me a little, this was many, many, many years ago, he said, Sean, there's a chance that you do it or you experience it differently than what you were thinking about. And a Your few days- The mental model might be different. That's right. A few days after that, a colleague of mine was talking about a trip that she had taken. And I thought, oh, that's for me. I want to do that too. And I realized that that was how my brain has wired that chemical marinade. I get inspired in the face of seeing something that I haven't yet experienced or accomplished. Now, one of my interns, I love to have interns from the University of Pennsylvania, so I often have undergrads from Penn as uh, interns. And one of them said to me, now, wait a minute, Sean, I gotta challenge you on this. I'm not so sure about this. She said, I would really love to be a Victoria's Secrets model, but that's never going to happen. And I said, what you really want to do is look at what's the experience underneath that. What are the feelings, the, um, what do you imagine the experience to be? And then how can you create that for yourself? And once she was able to get underneath that, she was able to see how, in fact, she could use that as a motivator to inform her actions. So, so as you coach your clients in this area, uh, uh, I, I know you've done it for many years. What's the best piece of advice you give most often to your clients to help them? So memorize those emotions, then memorize the questions to ask yourself. When you are emotionally hijacked, meaning when you're behaving in a way that is not aligned with who you want to be, that you're not in integrity, that you're not coming from a place of having processed yourself through it before taking action on it, stop, pause, potentially if you're somebody who needs uh, verbal processing, talk with somebody that you trust and work through those questions for the emotions rather than getting stuck in it. What creates depression, what creates people being stuck and not able to grow is when they have emotions that they haven't dealt with. Do you remember those old time typewriters that we used to use many, many years ago that some of you can't even visualize, but they had these keys and you would sometimes hit multiple keys at once and it would throw the typewriter, they'd stick together and then the, it would jam up the machine and it wouldn't work. Well, this is what happens to many of us. We've gotten jammed up inside and we're not aware of or experiencing our own emotions. And as a result, we're not coming out or engaging in a way with others that is inspiring to ourselves and others. And if we want to be inspiring leaders, inspiration comes from emotion. We have to be able to tap into our emotion and the emotions of others in order to be inspired. Yeah, you said something in that answer that I uh, like I'll go back to one word that you used, hijacked. Talk to me about what does, what is a hijack and what does it feel and look like? So many of us have seen a hijack watching sports. Think about uh, one of your favorite athletes, sports teams, and you can probably real quickly think back to a situation where an athlete got emotionally hijacked by something that happened and as a result their performance deteriorated. The same things happen to us in board meetings or conversations with colleagues and peers. If we get hijacked by an emotion that we have not processed ourselves through, we can, in essence, this idea of behaving in a way that's not aligned with who we want to be. So I might feel anger about something. And when I've learned to use anger in a healthy way, I can step back and say, oh, I'm noticing the feeling of anger in me. Let me look to see what's crossed my boundaries. 
let me look to see who do I need to talk to to make a request of. I don't even have to let that other person know that I'm angry. I need to ask for what I need in a way that they can hear it and understand it. But if I get hijacked, hmm, I might scream, yell, kick the dog. You know, obviously I never kick a dog, but that's metaphorically. I hope right, right. No, I love my dogs. But um, yeah, that, that, that scenario of somebody kicking a tire or punching a wall or these kinds of uh, outrageous. So is it, is it like an impulse to do something out of your character, out of your nature, that you may regret later because it was an instantaneous reaction? to something, uh, anger, or that, that caused you to say or do something that you might regret? Yes, it can cause us to burn a bridge. It can cause us to end a relationship that really was ready to be ended. It can cause us to quit a job or a project. It can cause us to walk out of a room in the middle of a conversation. So these are things that, that as a leader, of course, this is a, it's very important to recognize what these triggers are for you and how you might do that thing. So as, as, hence the essence of your coaching work. That's right. And so self-awareness and then self-regulation, being able to catch ourselves in it and then process ourselves through. So when I talk about that, it's really that self-regulation. And then using motivation. This is also a very important part of emotional intelligence. When we have high levels of emotional intelligence, we're able to raise our hand, if you will, for projects opportunities, relationships that will keep us engaged and inspired. Right, so navigating through our emotions a critical leadership competency. Definitely. Being able to also help a team to manage and lead a team to be able to uh, work on, focus on the goal, the outcome, without getting stuck in sidebar kinds of things with each other. Yes. Well, your book is great. I really enjoyed uh, reading it and looking through it and using some of the worksheets in there. Are there any additional resources that you might recommend our listeners to this podcast to look into around this area? So additional resources. I'm a really big believer that, as strange as this sounds, you can't develop emotional intelligence by reading. Right, it's like learning to drive in the, a uh, book. from a book. Right? That's right. So you've got to do it, right? So you have to actually do it. So it's getting the journal. And of course, my book asks you the questions that you can then process in my book or in a journal, but it's getting that journal and writing out your experience or speaking out your experience into a recorder and then listening back, reading back on a weekly or monthly basis to track your progress. So the book is How to Improve Your Emotional Intelligence at Work and in Relationships by Sean Kent Hayashi. It's a... Uh, step-by-step -step guide to raise your uh, ability to uh, uh, manage and, and regulate your emotional intelligence. So thank you, Sean. I appreciate you being here today, coming by to spend some time with us and uh, learning about this incredible topic. Look forward to having you back in the future. Thank you, Steve. I'm very inspired by what you're doing here, and I look forward to the great conversations you're going to be sharing with us in these podcasts. Thank you very much. Thank you.